Hello, everyone, and happy World Narcolepsy Day 2024. Yay! Mm -hmm. um, a little bit about World Narcolepsy Day. This is a day dedicated to celebrating and raising awareness about narcolepsy and the 3 million people around the world that are living with narcolepsy, their families, their loved ones, their supporters, and our whole community that comes together um, to, you know, everything, the advocacy and the awareness that happens around the year. But today is a day to celebrate um, this amazing community that we have. Uh, and today I'm very excited to have this great panel, um, but also to introduce you to Project Sleep's latest staff member, Farah Hassan, who will moderate today's conversation. Farah has just started this September at Project Sleep, and one of her first projects is to help us moderate this discussion. Uh, she recently graduated from the Health and Science Education Program at McMaster's University in Hamilton, Ontario, in Canada. Um, during her master's, she conducted research on the efficacy of using virtual reality headsets to teach clinical anatomy and develop curriculum proposals for sleep health education initiatives for parents and adolescent children. So, so cool. Uh, Farah has been involved with Project Sleep for quite a while. You might have heard her story as a Rising Voices speaker, and she's even um, done some advocacy work with us. She uh, tells her story of being diagnosed with idiopathic hypersomnia at age 21 after more than 15 years of experiencing symptoms. Uh, and she was an inaugural member of Project Sleep's Expert Advisory Board uh, and helped to consult on the development of our sleep helpline before she joined us on staff. So her new role as sleep education specialist, she'll be, run, she'll be running Project Sleep's Narcolepsy Awareness and Education Program and other sleep education and awareness programs. So all the way from Canada, please uh, welcome Farah to the team. Thank you so much, Julie. I'm very excited to be here and part of the team, um, and especially for today's conversation. We're uh, here to talk about the importance of storytelling, the media, and most importantly, to celebrate World Narcolepsy Day and the new Scientific American article that just came out. Um, if you haven't had a chance to check it out, we'll put the link in the chat, or you can go to Scientific American's website. Um, and if you have had a chance to check out the article already, you'll recognize Josh and Julie as two of the people who are featured in this article. Um, so hi, Josh. Hello. And, uh, yes. Glad to be where here. are you joining Portland, us from today? Uh, Portland, Oregon. Portland, Oregon. Okay. All yeah. right. Um, awesome. Well, we're very excited to have you here with us today. Uh, Josh Andrews is an American football offensive guard who played in the NFL for nine years. Uh, he played uh, college football at Oregon State uh, before becoming a member of the Philadelphia Eagles, Minnesota Vikings, Indianapolis Colts, New York Jets, Atlanta Falcons, and New Orleans Saints. Quite uh, an amazing career. Uh, Josh is also a husband, father, and a person living with narcolepsy. Um, we also have with us today, Julie Flygard, who many of you know as the president and CEO of Project Sleep and the award-winning author of Wide Awake and Dreaming, a memoir of narcolepsy. Um, she also helped to bring patient advocacy organizations together from around the world to establish World Narcolepsy Day in 2019. Uh, and now I would like to welcome our third panelist, Christian Emmering. Hello, Christian. Where are you joining us from today? Just outside of New York City. Go Jets. So. Okay. <laughs> awesome. So while not featured in the Scientific American article, Christian was instrumental in bringing this together. We are so excited to have him here with us today. Christian is the Director of External Communications at Harmony Biosciences, where he shapes strategic public relations initiatives that bridge corporate reputation, uh, advocacy and alliance engagement, and government affairs. In addition to his role at Harmony, he provides communications counsel to charitable and nonprofit organizations in the New York City area. So thank you to all of our panelists for joining us today. Uh, before we dive into this exciting conversation, um, just a quick reminder that this discussion is intended for educational and awareness purposes and is not medical advice. We want to empower people with information, um, but if anything that we discuss here today sparks questions for you about your own healthcare or medical management, please make sure that you bring those questions to your healthcare team or sleep specialist. 
Um, so with that, um, Josh, I'd like to actually start off with a little bit about your story. Uh, the Scientific American article describes your symptoms starting around age 12. So can you take us back to your teen years? What were you experiencing at that time? Yeah, yeah, uh, of course. You know, thank you for having me on here, first of all. And happy World Narcolepsy Day, everybody. But yeah, when I, uh, just a little bit by myself, um, really, like my, the earliest symptoms I had, now that I know what narcolepsy is, I didn't get diagnosed till I was 28 years old. And and just thinking back to my early years, um, I played a lot of sports growing up and and I was in the car a lot, going from place to place, tournament to tournament. And, and my mom, being a respiratory therapist for the last 30 years, still going. Um, she noticed that I would, I would I would fall asleep in the car instantly. You know what I mean? No matter what, where, I, where we would go, short ride, long ride, I'd be mm -hmm. out in the front seat and and just things like that. I've I've noticed growing up that it wasn't normal. You know what I mean? And, and anyone you can ask, any of my friends, like well, they would say that, like, man, you sleep a lot, dude. Like you need to get checked out. But it, me being an athlete, me just not really. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say I would, didn't care, but it just wasn't a priority to me at that time. You know what I mean? Right. Just being so young, didn't really pay attention to things that were going on as far as like self-help or health, you know? And, and yeah, that, that that was the biggest thing just, and that led all the way to high school and to college and until and, and this day. So, yeah. Gotcha. And so, you know, what is it that ultimately led you to a diagnosis and were you surprised by your diagnosis? Uh, yeah. So what led to me was actually my wife, um, we were driving. This was, it was when I was my rookie year in the NFL at this point. And we, it was a bye week and we had come home and I, we were, we, I don't know, we were doing activity. I'm not sure exactly where we were going, but me and my wife was driving. I was driving in the car and, and at that point I was, we were going for a while and I don't know, uh, I started to, to swerve off the road, you know, and me being stubborn, I'm like, okay, I can, I can keep going. And then led us to be, my wife was like, no, like I should drive. I was like, no, I can keep going. And sure enough, we almost fell off the road and almost, I wouldn't say we could have died, but you, who knows what could have happened, you know? And I felt like after that, I was, okay, it's time to take this a little bit more seriously and, and get diagnosed and, and figure out what's going on with my sleep. And, and that led, led me to a diagnosis, you know? Gotcha. Yeah. And, you know, when you did get that diagnosis, did you find that surprising? I mean, you'd been dealing with symptoms for a long time, but of course, a lot of it got written off. Um, yeah, yes, yeah, I definitely found it surprising just just from the. Uh, the at that point, I didn't really know what narcolepsy was and, and my my perception of narcolepsy was just negative, you know, and and. Right. I know we had talked about this with Julie before and she's done a bunch of posts and, 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 and just the stereotypical of what a narcolepsy person with living with narcolepsy is, is, is completely wrong, you know, and, and there's, it varies and there's severity to it. And I feel like I was at that point where I'm like, man, I don't fall asleep when I'm walking, you know what I mean? So like, there's no way I can have narcolepsy, but I don't know, just learning more and more about it. There's, there's levels to it for sure. And just realizing that now and, and you know that, that that felt like that definitely surprised me of knowing that there's levels to narcolepsy for sure so yeah absolutely surprised yeah me. okay yeah and julie what about you you know what were your early symptoms like and then you know how did you end up getting your diagnosis yeah so i think something that really stands out to me looking back now is uh, being in law school and trying to read a really dense case, um, a legal case. And um, I remember finishing the case, like I read, I read it and then thinking, I don't know what I just read. I can't remember any of it. And it wasn't the most interesting thing. Like it's pretty dense, like legal, you know, um, writing. But so I, I, so I started again, I'll read the case again. Um, and I still couldn't remember what I just read. So I tried a third time. And I think I wish now looking back that I had realized just how invisible sleepiness could be because my eyes were open. Technically I was reading, um, but nothing was really actually processing through my brain. So that's just an example, I think for me early on of um, starting to lose touch with reality um, or with wakefulness, I guess, um, in how kind of invisible it was. At the time I really thought I'd lost my willpower or I wasn't just meant for law school. Um, 
but yeah, and and similar to Josh, I guess it was it was a driving uh, incident that happened to me of driving to law school in the morning one day um, after getting a full night's sleep, and it was just a fifteen minute drive. Um, and I got to school just fine, but I didn't remember arriving at school or choosing a parking spot. Like, and that really scared right. me. And I thought, who can't drive 15 minutes in the morning? So that was the first time I thought, maybe I have a sleep problem, um, even though I thought I was a fine sleeper. Um, and uh, really, actually, I'd had um, these knee buckling with laughter incidences. And I didn't think that had anything to do with my sleep sleepiness problem. Um, but I was actually at a sports therapist, um, talking to her about a runner's knee issue, completely separate issue. And then she asked if my knees ever buckle. And I said, yeah, actually they do. When I laugh, it doesn't have to do anything with my running. And she thought she'd heard of that. And that was called cataplexy. And so I went home and I Googled the word cataplexy and saw that it was this form of muscle weakness, you know, specific to narcolepsy. And I thought, narcolepsy, like, no, I don't have that. that. Just like Josh, you know, like that's a joke about someone falling asleep while they're standing or in the middle of a conversation. But then I read the real symptoms of narcolepsy for the first time. And I saw excessive daytime sleepiness. And I was like, oh, wow, actually, that does make sense. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that sleepiness issue I've been having with driving and, and schoolwork. So um, yeah, you know, still just think like, so many people think it's just a joke or that you would fall asleep while you're standing. And um, the reality is it's a lot more invisible and, and hard to detect. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's interesting uh, that you say sleepiness is invisible. I think we hear a lot about invisible disabilities and things, but that in particular, you know, and I resonate with a lot of that experience of trying to get through textbook readings and yeah, um, absolutely. So seeing your faces and your stories published in a major magazine today is such an exciting and, and you know, really huge moment for the community. Um, but I'm curious because, you know, neither of you were always public about having narcolepsy. Um, and so Josh, you know, tell us why did you decide to speak up? And, you know, did you have any hesitations as an NFL player talking openly about having narcolepsy? Oh yeah, for sure. You know what I mean? For the, probably for the first year or so, I was, I wouldn't say I was necessarily embarrassed, but I was just like kept it on the low just because I don't know. It, it, it's not a good look to be like, okay, yeah, I have narcolepsy and I sleep all the time. You know what I mean? And, and for the longest, I thought that it, it would, it would affect my career, especially playing in the NFL. You know, it, it's such a cutthroat business and that, and you know, any opportunity you get to sp like speak out or I, I felt, I felt at that time, like it would, it would have been held against me. You know what I mean? I didn't realize how powerful it would, it would be to speak up on it until really until I met Julie, until I met Project Sleep, you know, I got involved with them. I really seen what she was doing in the community of, of people with, living with narcolepsy and it really inspired me. You know what I mean? And I, I really thank yeah. you, Julie, for, for really helping me come out of my shell with it you know what I mean and and really speaking up and and doing so I've, I've I've met so many people that have narcolepsy you know and Julie was the first person also I, that I met with narcolepsy so just knowing that I wasn't alone you know what I mean and that and that's what she's she Absolutely. preaches and, and and for like that really helped me to just share my story and doing so like people have reached out to me there's people that I, I've that have been close to me like oh I have a sleep problem too I have narcolepsy too I'm like what like you don't you don't realize how much of impact you have on others until I started sharing my story. And, and I realized that, and um, that's what I'm going to continue to keep doing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's you saying it's not a good look is so much of that misperception that ends up driving us to, to not share. So, you know, I mean, likewise, Julie was uh, a major part of, of my involvement in my story. So I'm glad she was there to help us both. Um, and Julie, you know, you mentioned you were pursuing law school when a lot of these major experiences were occurring. You know, did you have hesitations about sharing your story given, you know, you had these aspirations to become a lawyer? Definitely. And uh, my dad was an employment lawyer specifically. So he said not to share about it publicly that I could be discriminated against. Um, not because, you know, in the U.S. technically it's illegal, but they can just not hire you for any reason that they, you know, because they don't like the way your hair looks or whatever, you know, so, mm -hmm. um, so he actually really advised me and my dad was my best friend. Uh, and so he was who I looked to for advice on everything, never mind employment issues. Um, but I guess what happened was I 
um, it just sat in the back of my throat. You know, I started going to interviews and people asked me, why did you do badly on your first year of law school? You've done so well on your undergrad. And I could just feel it sitting on the back of my throat that I just wanted to say, you know, the most interesting thing, actually, um, because I, you know, uh, was diagnosed with narcolepsy recently and, and now I'm doing better, um, you know, uh, with treatments and I'm, and I'm on a better path now. Um, and I wanted to, to defend myself and, and to share what had happened. And I kept it back and it just didn't sit right with me. I can't explain it any other way. Um, and so I guess, you know, my dad's advice wasn't going to last very long. Um, and really when I started researching about, um, the sleep field and how, you know, um, not only did people think narcolepsy was a joke, but people thought sleep was a joke in our culture. And I saw that every day in law school, um, people bragging about still like pulling all nighters and that kind of stuff. And so when I was researching and seeing that sleep was the, you know, research had come along and that sleep was really important. Um, and I started to learn about sleep policy efforts that were happening in DC and, I just saw more and more that there was so much need in this community. Um, mm -hmm. And for me, I guess I always had believed in storytelling and I love creative nonfiction. So um, finally um, got pushed towards writing a book. I actually really thought I could write a book from under a rock, but that sounded good to me. Um, and so that I didn't have to like be in the media or, or you know, uh, <laughs> do this kind of stuff. Um, but then uh, people early on in the book process said, you know, if you really wanted to get a publisher, you need to be out in the media and speaking. And so I really actually pushed myself towards that, which might seem hard to believe now because I've totally embraced speaking and I love it now as an art form, truly. Um, but yeah, certainly wasn't my inclination um, to speak up. Um, but now it's so hard to think back that I, it just could never have been any other way. That's just that's just me. <laughs> um, yeah, Josh, I was trying to remember when you first did my cause my cleats with the NFL and you reached out to me and asked if you could have Project Sleep as the cause that you did it with. I think at the time you weren't even public, like even in that first announcement, I don't think we even said like that you were we just kind of said, right, that you were doing it because, you know, but you don't think you even said that publicly that you were a person with narcolepsy at that time. Yeah, I did. You know what I mean? I def definitely didn't come out at that point. But I was like, man, this is this is something that is is part of me now. You know what I mean? Something that I, I, I want to represent. And then I, I stumbled across you on, on Instagram on accident. You know what I mean? And, and I happened to look where we're at now, you know, and and it's it's such a, a really a privilege to, to be associated with you and and really it, it, it's been awesome you know what I mean this journey has been awesome and I wouldn't have it any other way you know what I mean I feel like God has is, is, is put me in this position for a reason you know and and I'm gonna keep leaning into that for sure so yeah. well Julie I'm I'm you know glad and that you chose to share because uh you know that sense of community that we've sort of touched on um that comes through storytelling and realizing you know like you said Josh that people that have been in your life for a long time have often also been, you know, quietly on the sidelines struggling with things. And, you know, it really is because of initiatives like this um, that we get to come together. So it's very powerful. Um, so, you know, I'd like to get into the article um, that we're chatting about today as well. Um, Scientific American happens to be one of my favorite magazines, um, so much so that my friends actually gifted me a subscription for my birthday a few years ago. Uh, um, and so, you know, they featured narcolepsy a few times over the years, but there hasn't been an article in quite some time. Um, so Christian, can you tell us, you know, how this all came together? Yeah, happy to. And before I do that, I just want to extend my gratitude to you, Julie, and Project Sleep for allowing me to participate in this, you know, your contributions to the Scientific American article. And, you know, I know that those sentiments are shared, you know, by the entire organization of Harmony Biosciences and its people. And then to you, Josh, as well, for being such a passionate champion um, for narcolepsy advocacy, uh, both through your work with Project Sleep and then our progress at the Heart Program, um, you know, which is touched on in the article and, you know, is really about raising external awareness and appreciation of the work that various advocacy organizations and NGOs are doing, you know, to raise awareness and combat disparities and inequities in this area. Um, it, it is fascinating. I mean, Scientific American has long been one of my favorite publications as well. And, you know, not only for the science, but the ways in which they are able to 
elevate and amplify um, stories that are happening at a local community level, but are having a profound impact, right, on scientific progress, improving healthcare um, across our country. And, you know, as someone who um, I suppose is relatively new to this space, um, you know, there there were a lot of aspects of uh, of sleep wake of narcolepsy. You know that I I agree. I had not I had not read a whole lot about lately in Scientific American. So it just felt like there was an opportunity. Um, you know, to to tell a story here. And you know, I had done a number of projects um, with their publication team in the past. In a prior life, when I worked uh, primarily with oncology clients. Um, helping to elevate, as I mentioned, um, you know, a lot of the great and impactful work that was happening in that community, right, but that was not rising up to a national level. Um, and I felt that that there was an opportunity to do something very similar here. Um, you know, the the relationship, Julie, you know, that our organization has with you, um, you know, that collaboration you know, and 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 the friendship, you know, that you and I, you know, have been able to develop over the over the last year or so. It it just felt like the work that you were doing in creation of World Narcolepsy Day, its significance. And then Josh, you know, just how inspiring your story and journey has been felt like the perfect notes, right? You know, to come through um this article uh on such an important day for the narcolepsy community. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Christian, I know you've got an extensive background in healthcare communications. Um, and, you know, as a recent graduate myself from a program focused on education and the health sciences, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on what you see as, you know, the biggest storytelling opportunities that the narcolepsy community has to raise greater awareness. Uh, you know, and, and do you see any unique challenges that are specific to us or, you know, maybe to, to other challenges you've encountered elsewhere? Yeah, it's a great it's a great question, um, you know, and I'm, I'm going to try to tackle that from a few different aspects. I mean, on on the one hand, you know, the narcolepsy community, I, I, I am constantly in in awe and admiration of the resilience, the strength um, emanating from this community, the work, you know, Julie, that you have done to to help empower other advocates, you know, people like Josh, you know, others who, you know, prior to their relationship with you may not have envisioned themselves sharing their stories, right, you know, or who maybe, you know, did not see an opportunity out in the world like World Narcolepsy Day, you know, for them to come together, you know, and to speak, you know, and to drive meaningful change. So from a storytelling standpoint, there is nothing wrong, you know, with repeating a message. It's very important, especially when it's not being heard. Um, you know, but for me, I I try to look for for organizations and initiatives, you know, that that have inherent storytelling opportunities, right? So World Narcolepsy Day, that is a moment in time, right, that has been created, right? So it right. lends itself, right, you know, to that kind of story that is timely, that is compelling, that has multiple aspects to it, spanning um, advocacy, you know, the importance of ensuring timely diagnosis, raising awareness in ways that help to squash certain stigmas perpetuated, maybe yeah. in some cases by the very media itself, you know, not scientific American, of course, but I'm thinking more, you know, in terms of the broader Hollywood television, film, yeah, right, right. all of that. I mean, Julie had spoken about that at the beginning, right? So, you know, in some, in some important respects, you know, we, we have an obligation, right, to engage more meaningfully with the media, right, you know, in mm -hmm. order to help combat, you know, and, and do away, um, you know, with these pervasive stereotypes of what a person with narcolepsy is experiencing. Um, you know, the other 
thread of your question, which I I, I think had more to do with, um, you know, are there learnings from from other areas, you know, mm -hmm. in the public health world? I, I think absolutely. Um, you know, prior to my role at Harmony, I was in the New York City public relations world um, on the uh, working for an agency for um, about a decade. And that was a valuable experience for me because I had an opportunity to work with a variety of different clients in a variety of different therapeutic areas. You know, and just because, you know, something is having an impact, say, in oncology, you know, or in cardiovascular health, that doesn't mean, you know, that that program, you know, or that approach can't provide value for a disease area like sleep weight, especially if, you know, it is meant to address certain fundamental issues, like how do we get people timely access to diagnosis right. and care, right? How do we educate? Um, you know, about about the symptoms um, of a certain condition, um, you know, and I think that's especially true in the area of rare diseases, um, mm -hmm. you know, narcolepsy, of course, um, you know, is is also a rare condition, you know, and that um, contributes in an important way to, um, you know, how long it takes, right, to reach a timely diagnosis, Um 10 years and up, you know, for, for some people, um, you know, the fact that there are not as many large institutional advocacy organizations like there are for other disease areas um, in this country, you know, the fact that um, the advancement of research, you know, in, in some ways, you know, is subject to many of the same underlying dependencies that other rare conditions are, you know, small mm -hmm. patient populations, um, you know, maybe there aren't as many specialists, you know, available in a certain geography or region, right? So these are all challenges that I, I think it helps to maintain, you know, as broad a perspective as possible into the public health landscape, because as I mentioned, there might be learnings from one disease state, you know, that apply here. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I think that's a like a, a very critical point just to keep in mind that there are obviously differences, but those key things, like you said, you know, advocacy, education, you know, diagnosis, all of those things are are, you know, certainly common in certain ways. Yeah. Um, so Josh and Julie, uh, you know, I know the article just came out, so maybe you haven't had responses on that quite yet. Um, but I'd love to hear about, you know, what kinds of responses you've received over the years as you've shared your stories, you know, how have your friends and family responded? Um, and I'm curious, you know, what are some of the funny or unexpected things that people have asked you when you tell them that they have narcolepsy? Um, so Josh, maybe if you want to start us off. Nah, <laughs> uh, a lot of my friends when I tell them like, it makes complete sense. You know what I mean? I, I still mm -hmm. remember in college, like, I, I kid you not, there's probably like a handful of friends that have tons and tons of pictures of me passed out in the most random places. And they're like, okay, it makes complete sense. I feel like that's probably the funniest thing. Just seeing all these pictures of like, yeah, I'm, I can't help it, man. That, that That's just who I am at this point, you know? And, and I feel like I've learned to embrace that. And, and, and it, it gives me a chance to explain to them what narcolepsy is. So I, I feel like I've, I've, I've learned to to take the jabs, you know what I mean? But they use it as like an educational time to to really explain like narcolepsy and what it is, you know, and and what 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 I what, what people go through with narcolepsy. And and yeah, it, it, it and oh, I'm trying to think what else. I feel like my um yeah, I feel like it, it it's been positive, you know what I mean? For the most part, mm -hmm. it's been positive feedback, you know, and and people understand now, you know, and but like telling them that they're like it 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 humanizes me almost you know what I mean especially yeah. when me me playing football you know and you're at this pedestal and and when you tell people that man like you're just like me at the end of the day you know what I mean yeah. like especially when people I run into people that also have narcolepsy and I'm able to relate with them and I feel like that's been a great thing for me you know what I mean just to be able to relate to people and show them that like I I'm the same way as you you know what I mean like yes yeah. We, we might have different statuses, but we go through the same thing each and every day. So that, that, that's that been a great thing that I've, I've loved about this. So. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, a beautiful thing to take even the things that could be negative and use them as, you know, an opportunity to to help raise awareness and, and make people aware. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
And yeah, Julie, Yeah, from your I think experiences. I think that it's um it was surprising to me at first that um uh mm, I don't know if I've had a different exp experience from Josh or not, but I didn't feel that my friends and family got it right away. Um I actually felt pretty isolated. Um and I didn't really know how to explain it to them either, right? So cuz I was still realizing the few months in um the first year or so I had a hard time explaining it. I was, I remember feeling really angry and really sad that this, you know, condition was taking over my life seemingly. Um, but I didn't know how to articulate um, what I was going through very well. Um, and I honestly don't, I had some people that were very there for me. I had one friend who emailed me every day early in the journey. How are you feeling? And she said uh, that she didn't care if I responded or not, but if I wanted to, I could vent, you know, to her. And I remember asking her later, I said, how did you know to like do that? To, you know, she goes, I don't know, Julie, I thought law school was so challenging that I just could not imagine anything on top of just being in law school. So the fact that you were going through narcolepsy in law school, I just thought, oh, I don't know how you're doing it. And so that she just every day asked that, how are you feeling? Um, so that kind of support did mean so much. But I will say that over time, I was really surprised how people in my life showed up for me in different ways. So, you know, maybe I didn't have like huge heart to hearts with every single friend. Uh, but then when I started getting involved in advocacy and I started fundraising for um, research or hosting a sleepwalk and some some of those friends I'd never really had huge, great conversations with, they showed up in that way. Um, and it was really interesting to see that over time, I, I did feel that people showed up for me. I just couldn't like always force other people's journeys, you know, and yeah. how they understood my narcolepsy or how they supported me, but that, um, you know, eventually really uh, a lot of people did come around. And then like Josh said, it's been so cool to find the narcolepsy community. And so with that, I think it also, it took a lot of pressure off of my um, my friends and family outside of the narcolepsy community to be everything right. for me. Cause now I have my narcolepsy friends. So, yeah. you know, so that was always good too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, and, and I remember, you know, getting in, involved with, uh, with the rising voices program and it's, it's so impactful to go from, you know, like you said, kind of isolated and, you know, trying to navigate it and figure out how to explain things to literally being in a room with people who just know, they just understand it's been their experience. Um, it's, it's a, it's an incredible feeling. Yeah. yeah. I'll just add too. I think those media opportunities, uh, are so powerful in elevating this cause. So um, I know with a few other key things, like when I was in a Marie Claire magazine, you know, friends went out and bought that magazine. And just the other day, a friend I posted, you know, I'd found it cleaning up. I'd found an extra copy. I didn't need any more because I probably actually have like 20 copies. But um, <laughs> and I post on Instagram and one of my best friends said, I still have that magazine that you were in, too. You know, oh, um, and I just think that really for any stragglers that don't kind of like understand uh, maybe like those moments of being in the media, I think um, they give a validation to our experience yeah. uh, in a really easy to understand way that uh, is just so powerful. So again, it's just a huge, huge moment for our community to be in scientific American. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Josh, you know, since you became a public advocate. Um, you've had some really cool experiences connecting with the community through different organizations and events. You know, I know um, Julia touched on uh, a couple before, but um, what have been some of the highlights from your advocacy journey so far? Man, that's a great question. Uh, uh, well, probably um, just speaking at uh, the Black Men's Brain Health was probably one of my top things. Just because the, Dr. Turner's amazing, you know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. and just what he's doing in that that realm, mainly with Alzheimer's, but really just this diseases in general, I mean, it, it's, it's just good to spread that within the black community, you know what I mean? And for like, that's something that is not really talked about, you know, and it, it's almost taboo to sleep, to talk about sleep, you know, and just bringing that awareness has been one of my favorite things, you know what I mean? And, and just to help spread the word with, with, with the types of things that are uh, black men are going through. And really, um, I would definitely say the sleep conference, sleep 2024, speaking at the hyper somnia foundations, uh, uh, conference was amazing. You know what I mean? I, I met so many, that was the most people I've had, met that had narcolepsy or had hypersomnia yeah. or type two, um, 
narcolepsy and, and I'm like, man, like it, it, there's a community of us out there. And just to see those people in person and be able to relate in person was, was huge for me. You know what I mean? I, I met Dr. Rai who I haven't seen since 2021. And he was one of the people that I, I, I just think all the time, like, man, if I, if I didn't have access to this, like, man, well, where would I be today? You know? And, and I'm just yeah. extremely grateful for really all these opportunities that are coming my way. That I, to be able to use my platform to just to, just to spread narcolepsy and, and and just spread awareness, you know. So the, the, those are probably the top two things that I've been in. Of course, working with Project Sleep, you know, I can't I can't leave them. <laughs> out, you know, that that's for sure, you know. And yeah, that's that's always one of my top things that I've I've loved to do, you know. And, and I'm probably going to continue to work with them for for as long as they, they for I can live, you know what I mean. And so yeah, yeah, those two those two things the three things for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think that storytelling piece really goes hand in hand with building community and, you know, by telling these stories, you know, like you said, we're able to also reach communities where certain topics are more stigmatized and, you know, like really, again, reach, reach a diverse group. And that's such an important part of, you know, making progress as a whole. Um, so, you know, like with Project Sleep, we're also very proud to be training advocates through our Rising Voices program. We've trained over 160 speakers and storytellers in 18 countries around the world, myself included. And, you know, I'm sure many of the people listening in today, um, you know, Kristen, we've, we've heard from Josh and Julie on some of the different ways that they've been able to engage in storytelling. Um, and I'm wondering for our advocates who are looking to engage with the media, um, what elements of our experiences do you think could resonate more, you know, specifically with the media to help amplify our message? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, first and foremost, you know, it's to join and to reach out to an organization like Project Sleep. Right. You know, it's to it's to realize, um, you know, when you are ready. Right. You know, there is no rush to do this. Right. But your experience, your story as a patient, as a caregiver, as an advocate, you know, is meaningful. You know, it is hugely important. And, you know, it will help to comprise, you know, this chorus of voices, you know, that Julie and Josh, you know, have cultivated and nurtured, you know, and look, I mean, so many voices, right, you know, are stronger together, you know, as opposed to just one, right? So, you know, that that would really be the first way, right, you know, and to learn from each other. I mean, even Josh, you know, as he mentioned, getting to know him over the last year or so, you know, I think a huge part, you know, of 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 um, being able to tell that story that you know is true in your heart, right, but that you haven't had an opportunity, you know, to maybe express or verbalize yet, right, but in the company mm -hmm. of others going through similar experiences, that becomes much easier to do. Um, you know, for us, it is, it is certainly to do that, um, you know, and it's also, it's also to, you know, participate in programs, you know, like what we did together with Scientific American. I mean, we do a number of media programs um, through Harmony, right, uh, that engage and elevate and convene the patient advocacy community, you know, but we're not really able to do that, right, unless, you know, there's that groundswell, right, you know, coming up from the advocacy organization, we're then able to amplify and elevate further, um, mm -hmm. you know, and support the advocacy community, you know, in ways that are hugely important to bring more voices in. Um, but in in short, you know, it is it is really to to remember that, you know, all of you listening, um, and if you're looking to participate, you know, in, in initiatives like this, like your voice and experience matters, share it, you know, when ready, um, you know, and it's that human experience that I think is, is hugely important, um, you know, because while similar, you know, with respect to the condition, um, I mean, as we've heard today, right, you know, all of our lives are different, right, you know, and we each have a unique voice to share. Um, so, so I think that's a huge, you know, first step, right, in, in getting involved, engaging with the media, you know, and then coalescing with organizations like Project Sleep, um, you know, to find topics of importance, you know, that really get at the heart of a particular issue, you know, uh, opportunities to collaborate, 
um, you know, with other advocacy organizations, you know, mm -hmm. and, 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 and other not for profit organizations, um, you know, especially in the area of reducing stigma. Um, I, I, I think, you know, personally, that's probably one of the biggest opportunities, um, you know, just given how pervasive for so long, right, yeah. so many of these stigmas have been. Yeah, and, you know, I, I, I love that encouragement that you gave of, you know, when you're ready, go ahead and and, and share, um, because like you said, every, every story and every voice is unique and, you know, we're all united in the experiences in a lot of ways, but each, each perspective is, is just really rich. Um, absolutely. Um, Josh, what would you say to people living with narcolepsy who aren't sure about openly sharing their stories yet? Yeah. Um, like you just said, it, it, it's all on your timing. You know what I mean? And, and, like the one thing I didn't realize before I shared my story is how much of an impact you have on on others that with narcolepsy. You know what I mean? And and how how your story makes people relate to you and 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 it makes people open up. You know and and like it just gives people confidence at the end of the day. You know to be like okay, like they're dealing with this. Like I, I got something similar. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Just having your input. You know it it just adds adds value to others. You know, and, and I feel like that at the end of the day, like I'm able to 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 motivate somebody and and have them feel more confident. Like then then why not share your story? You know, and, and but it's on your timing, though. You know what I mean? I feel like your story is always going to be there. You know, and and whenever you're ready to do it, do it, man. And, and I feel like yeah, that's all. That's all I got. Hopefully. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, like you said, there's this ripple effect. I think you know, just by making the choice to speak up when you're ready, it, it just it it's incredible how many people you can touch that way. So absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Julie, in the Scientific American article, you mentioned that the way people responded to you when you shared your diagnosis, you know, was really isolating. Um, but as we all know, eventually you were able to go from not wanting to talk about your diagnosis to writing a book and then founding an organization. Um, you know, you, you talked a little earlier about, you know, how friends and family have influenced, you know, your your advocacy journey. Um, but, you know, we'd also love to hear, you know, what are some important things that loved ones can do to support advocates who have narcolepsy? Yeah, I think, you know, loved ones. Um you know, this day really is, should be also completely dedicated to them as well. Uh, the journey of those that support us is in and of itself a journey um, and a valid experience and an important experience. And we're so grateful for those that um, show up and are supportive and um, caring. So uh, in a way, you know, just to first just say thank you to the caregivers and the loved ones that are out there. Um you know, I don't know, um, having been um, in my 20s when I was diagnosed, I think, you know, I was already out of my house, you know, like I was living with friends. And um, so it's always something that really touches my heart when I hear from parents of, of children of with narcolepsy. And, um, you know, sometimes the parents want the kid to move along in their journey, you know, at a different pace than the parent wants. And, uh, and I, I just, always try to remind the parent, um, just like, thank you for being so supportive, even if their kid can't maybe say that to them or doesn't say that to them uh, at that time, because um, the love and the support of a parent uh, is so invaluable, especially because this can be so isolating and um, with so much stigma still out there that going to school, um, you know, with narcolepsy can just feel um, scary and, and, and lonely. So, um, just, yeah, a huge thanks to the, to the loved ones out there and then how they can get involved. There's lots of ways, you know, actually our rising voices program, we have had a few, uh, like loved ones actually participate and share, uh, with permission of their person that has narcolepsy in their life or has a sleep disorder in their life, um, to actually become a trained speaker as well. Um, we've only had a few people do that, but I think that's a really cool way too, because, um, sometimes those people are less sleepy, uh, and might actually, you know, be able to do some of that, that hard work. Uh, there's lots of volunteering opportunities also behind the scenes with Project Sleep, um, but also with other organizations, um, important to mention, uh, Wake Up Narcolepsy, Narcolepsy Network, and the Hypersomnia Foundation in the U.S. are all great organizations 
And in addition, there's, I think we have 32 different organizations now around the world that co-lead World Narcolepsy Day. So there's a lot of great ways to get involved with those organizations and, and volunteer and advocate behind the scenes. But, um, you know, just, yeah, a huge amount of gratitude and um, and thanks for showing up and in different ways um, from, from sharing their own experience publicly, um, but also to, um, you know, just being there for your loved one. It's pretty awesome too. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think like you said, you know, being a part of an advocate's journey is in and of itself a journey and, you know, just encouraging um, other caregivers to get involved is again, just building that community out further, which is so important. Yeah. Um, speaking of loved ones, Josh, uh, as a father, you have talked about how when your kids were young, you know, it worked out nicely that you could take a nap along with them. Um, you know, as your kids are getting older, how have you gone about explaining your condition and your needs to your kids? Yeah, it, that, uh, it's, it's funny you say that. I was just uh, talking to my daughter the other day about narcolepsy. She she just started kindergarten this year, so like it's 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 been fun just just watching them grow. But as far as explaining it to them, I, I feel like as they get older, I feel like I go into more details. But right now, I I, I just try to keep it basic, you know, and and just tell them like Dad has a sleeping problem, you know. I feel like that just just that alone, like they're able to resonate like and then as they get older they'll probably get they'll for sure get more curious you know what I mean if like kids yeah. are curious in general I'm able to just explain it to them more and more you know and to the point where I'm like okay like they know what like a sleep disorder is you know and and I, I I pray that they don't have any sleep disorders down the road but if they do they know where to turn they know where to go and, yeah. and so like that, 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 that's why I'm grateful for it for just knowing what narcolepsy is and other sleep conditions are, you know, and I can see the signs. So it doesn't have to be 10 years down the road before they get diagnosed, yeah. you know? And, and, and so I, that that's the approach I'm taking with my kids right now. So it's, it's been fun though. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I think we, when we think about storytelling, so much of it is sort of directed at the community and the public. Um, but, you know, what you just said about sort of starting to share that within our own families so much of you know that understanding and that empathy just comes from literally choosing to be you know open about your own experience with your kids and your loved ones so um you know i'm i'm so glad to hear that that's that's going to have such a big impact Absolutely. Yeah. You know what? Somehow I think it's easier to be, uh, you know, uh, courageous for me with the media than with my own family. <laughs> so I don't know what that says about me, but uh, I think that that you're right, Farah, like that kind of that bravery and courage is important. Really, really important. <laughs> I got to work on that. <laughs> well, I think it's hard, right? I mean, we have certain expectations of one another and we've, you know, especially with close family and friends, you've known them for so long that their perception of you is a certain way. So I, I I can I can definitely resonate with some of that, Julie. Um, no, I feel okay. it probably it's, it's probably harder with 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 adults. You know what I mean? Because yeah. they already have their perceptions of of things of narcolepsy right. or sleep in general. So with with kids, it's it has been a little bit easier for sure, Julie. I would say just because they're 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 learning every day. You know what I mean? So just to be able to yeah, put that perspective on them at a young age has been so helpful, but. I definitely hear what you're saying. That's, that must be tough just as an adult, kind of like, okay, like, I like, you know, and, and knowing you for so long and to this mm -hmm. point, we're like, okay, like, I don't, I don't understand like what that is, you know? So, uh, okay. Yeah. Right. Cause you both want to be the same person. Like I am the same person I was before. Oh, but wait, um, I might need a nap. Um, you know, it might disrupt our plans, you know, <laughs> um, stuff like that. So yeah, we all, we all have our journey though, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Um, so as we wrap up with today's discussion, um, you know, Christian, I, I think this article is an incredibly powerful example of collaboration. Um, and, you know, so how can collaborations like this one enhance our efforts to elevate narcolepsy awareness? I mean, it's the only way, you know, to, to truly elevate awareness of narcolepsy, um, you know, and make progress against it. Um, you know, the article for sure, you know, brings together perspectives, you know, from national advocates, you know, from Josh, um, a professional as well, who contributed to this. And, you know, it it really is, it really is the only way, um, you know, both in terms of how, um, 
we can bring in and promote more collaboration among, you know, the core narcolepsy community, right? People who are affected by it, people who are caregiving and advocating, but also, you know, in terms of how that, you know, imparts a greater voice, you know, to reach new audiences that are really important for making progress. And, you know, it 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 it's certainly, it's certainly, you know, being expansive in that way, but also how do we position narcolepsy, um, you know, as, as um, a part of the broader rare disease conversation, right? I mean, there are, are, are so many, you know, thousands of rare conditions, many of which, as I mentioned, you know, subject to the same underlying challenges, you know, that people with narcolepsy face, right? So how can, how can we join hands, you know, with, with, with those communities as well, knowing that the experience, um, you know, that you all have is very different, of course, based on your condition, but is united by the fact, right, that it's, it's, it's a rare condition, you know, and the other point I want to make is, um, you know, just acknowledging the primacy and the importance of sleep, right, for overall health and well-being. And, you know, we, we know, you um, how important that is, you know, to maintain health in a variety of conditions. Um, and I think an opportunity, um, you know, is there to um, reach more of that conversation, right? You know, how how we can promote sleep health, right? You know, and 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 everything that that means within a broader conversation right about health and wellness and public health broadly um you know that that will allow this this incredibly resilient and 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 inspiring community to tap into even bigger audiences right and i think that is an opportunity going forward and one that can be achieved through storytelling you know opportunities with outlets like scientific american um, you know, Harmony is 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 proud to have created uh, the first ever uh, program on rare diseases with the Washington Post Live as well. Um, you know, so there are a lot of forums, you know, through which these these messages and these stories, you know, can be elevated in order to inspire. Yeah, and you know, I think Julie had touched on this, but this culture of, you know, how we see sleep and misperceptions and, you know, not realizing just how critical it is, like you said, Christian, for, you know, overall health and wellness. And, and again, that being sort of an avenue for us to reach bigger audiences is really important. Yeah. Um, so that pretty much brings us to the end of today's broadcast. Um, a huge thank you to all of our attendees, to our amazing panelists. Um, you know, just on a personal note, my first experience with World Narcolepsy Day was 2021 uh, when I joined as, you know, a rising voices speaker. And, uh, you know, it's hearing, you know, even the three of you talk today. And even though I've been involved for a while, it's just this incredible reminder of how that storytelling experience allowed me to be part of this community that, you know, it wasn't like I knew it was there and I didn't feel like part of it. I just didn't even know it existed. Um, so again, you know, thank you to, to everyone for sharing their stories, um, you know, and a huge congratulations on, you know, being a part of this really big article with Scientific American um, and happy World Narcolepsy Day. Uh, I'm going to turn it back to Julie to to tie things off. Yeah, well, huge thank you to Farah for uh, stepping into a new professional role with Project SEEP and taking on leading this broadcast soon thereafter. So uh, fantastic job. And thank you to Farah. And uh, yeah, just thanks to everyone. It's pretty surreal. Sometimes World Narcolepsy Day to me still kind of feels a little fake because at one point it was just an idea in my head. Um, and then to, uh, when you talk about collaboration, Christian, the, uh, narcolepsy organization leaders around the world from Australia to Ireland, um, to Sweden, to Italy, to the UK, uh, Japan, these are the leaders that said, yeah, yeah, we believe in your idea. They stepped forward with me first. And, um, it's incredible to see what that turns into. I think, you know, the moments that always 
pull at my heart is when we see posts from people that say, you know, I, I wouldn't have shared this, but it's World Narcolepsy Day, so I'm sharing. Um, and I just think that's just so surreal and cool. And, and that's the hope and the dream. So, um, yeah, thank you to everyone. Have a happy world in our clubs day. Keep posting, keep sharing. And, um, we just can't wait. The best is yet to come. All right. Thank you guys.